start recording. Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. You know, I guess, now that I've said this multiple times when we started, like all this week I think I opened with, we're going to get to play around with our debug visualization today. But every day we were thwarted because we had like some nasty bug stuff that happened and, and things like this. And so here it is Thursday and we have not gotten to do it and I think now we can actually do it because all of our stuff was working uh, and we actually will get the chance to do that. So I would like to actually do that because I've been wanting to do it for a while and so I'm looking forward to it. So I'm going to jump right in. Today is day 188 so if you want to follow along, if you ordered, uh, if you pre-ordered the game on handmadehero.org, um, you want to unpack day 187 source code because that's what I'm starting with today. So if you're trying to follow along at home, that's, that's where you're at. That's what you're doing. Uh, so let's go ahead and open open uh, up the old, give it the old Emacs here, and uh, let's let's just take a look at where we were. Uh, so here was our debug sort of, uh, you know, our, our debug output, and you know, there's a couple things that you kind of notice here. Uh, there, one of the things that that is clearly true, um, as I kind of look at it, is it gets a lot slower as the game goes. And I think that makes sense because the number of events, remember we're just kind of piling them up into a buffer until we get 64 frames worth of uh, debug events that we're processing through. And when you think about what that means, I feel like uh, that sort of suggests that we don't want to be processing everything all together like that, right? We probably want to process as soon as we see a frame boundary, kind of like store off the debug information for that frame in a processed fashion, I would think. Uh, so that we can then, you know, we can essentially avoid this whole uh, nastiness. So I feel like there's some optimization that we want to do there. Uh, but I'm just going to, instead of doing that, I think what I'd rather do is just set the number of debug frames down to a low number so that we can play around with the visualization because I want to do that first uh, before I try to do any sort of optimization stuff. Because I've been, like I said, been wanting to do that for a while, but we kind of had to put it off for bugs. And I'd like to do that. Uh, before we kind of go back in and look at how do we keep it performant and keep it from uh, taking some, you know, too much of our time or something like that. So uh, the max debug event array count, you know, if I were to set that down from 34 uh, to something like 8, right, so that we have a lot less frames to deal with, I strongly suspect, yeah. So you can see how the frame rate is drastically better, right? So what that suggests to me is that processing the frame information, like we could easily test, be testing the game in this, in this, uh, at this frame rate. This is fine. Uh, and this is still doing eight frames. So it would be eight faster, eight times faster if we only did one, right? Uh, or I should say it would take one eighth of the time. So it looks to me like that's going to be a good solution for us going forward. So we can do that before we kind of move off this. We can spend a little time making sure that we kind of do one at a time that way. Uh, but in the meantime, what I want to do, like I said, first, I'd like to spend a few days making the system into something that's useful to us in terms of visualization. Because right now we can sort of start to see, like we're getting, there's some information that we get from this. We can see, we can visualize how our threads are working. Like we can see how long it takes for the threads to kick in. We can see the threads doing their rendering work here and how much uh, time they're using to do that. We can see the debug rendering happening up here. We can see what we're doing in terms of processing the debug information and how long that takes and then waiting for frames. We can see all that stuff happening. So we, we're already getting a little bit of heads up, but it's really pretty janky, right? It's pretty ugly. It's hard to see what's going on. And more importantly, uh, well, two things more importantly, I can't actually like hover over any of this and find out what the actual bars correspond to, even though, you know, we have that information, right? So I can't do that. And furthermore, there's no way for me to like zoom in on this or open up one of these bars and say, hey, you know, show me for this particular bar, right, that we got here. Um, we may know a lot more information about what's actually happening in here, uh, like what it's what child uh, process, um, what child functions were executing in there, and which ones took time and that sort of thing. But we have no way of of interfacing with that. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to open this up a bit, uh, try to make a little bit of a UI for it, essentially, where we can navigate through the debug information uh, in a way that allows us to actually get get out what's what's already being recorded because right now we have a tremendous amount of information being recorded we just don't have any way of actually looking at it it's a visualization problem basically 
Uh, and that's what I want to start tackling because the only way this debug information is actually going to do us the kind of good that I want it to do uh, is if we can, you know, quickly get what we need out of it. So the first thing that I'd like to do is just make a little something so that I can interact with these things. Uh, some way that I could like click on a bar, for example. Uh, I just want to start with something like that. Uh, so how would we do that, right? Uh, well, if you remember, a long time ago, we actually did include, uh, and I should probably open up Hamway Platform here, we did include mouse, right? So there's the mouse uh, in our game input. We've got mouse X, we've got mouse Y. Uh, we even have mouse Z. I don't know if we ever implemented mouse Z. Uh, I'm not sure we actually did that. That's the mouse wheel. Uh, and I don't know if we ever, uh, oops, sorry, Win32 handmade. I, I don't think we ever did that, uh, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, yeah, we don't support mouse wheel yet. So we haven't actually implemented that in the platform layer, so we wouldn't get any of those. Uh, but we did implement uh, the, the rest of the stuff. So in terms of getting the mouse, the mouse buttons, uh, and the XY position of the mouse, that's actually stuff that we can already do for free. It just comes in and we can use it. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to go ahead and implement uh, just some light UI so that we can, um, we can browse that debug information. So let's start with the simplest possible thing. I'm gonna do the simplest possible thing first just to show you how we're gonna do that and we'll talk a little about it. The simplest possible thing I think would just be hover. I just wanna be able to hover the mouse over one of those bars and then I want, uh, when I hover over the bar, I want it to show me, I'll just have it print out, let's say, I want it to print out uh, what the name of that function was, right? Just like, like what's the function that I'm hovering over right now? So in order to do that, the first thing you have to do is you have to get the mouse information to the debug system, right? Because it comes in and, uh, and, and uh, it doesn't actually, the co there's no conduit, right? There's no way uh, to actually get that information down. And so what I'd like to do is just take a look here. We've got this debug overlay. It gets past the game memory. It does not get past any game input. And so what I'd like to do there, again, is just have some way, and we'll do this the simplest way possible. We may have to upgrade this a little bit uh, in the future as we do more in terms of game input, but for, for right now, uh, it should be sufficient. When we are here in you know, our main routine, our land of, of people who have not kind of been, uh, been sort of cleaned up and moved out yet, our game update and render, that's got the game input here, right? It has the game input. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just start passing that game input directly into the debug overlay. I'm just gonna say, here you go. Uh, you can have that now. So then we have game input, uh, we've got that. And so in here, we now know what the X, Y location of the mouse is. We could just look it up directly in there and that's no problem, right? So now what I'm gonna do uh, is I'm gonna say, well, if we take a look, uh, we've got in, in here, we have these rectangles, right? Uh, and we're putting those rectangles you know, onto, uh, onto the render stack. If we have the rectangle and we have the mouse X and Y, there's no reason we can't just compare those two and figure out whether or not there's a particular rectangle that we're over, right? That should be a very simp simple thing to do. Uh, so what I can do inside this routine is I can just say like, okay, you know, uh, if like mouse in rectangle or something like that, right? And I can just pass it like maybe the input struct or whatever. Uh, if, I, if the mouse is in the rectangle uh, and, and then I'm gonna have the rectangle somehow, so I'm just gonna say rectangle here. If the mouse is in the rectangle, then what I'd like to do is output a line of debug text, like we, cause we already have that going, so I'll just use it, right? Uh, we'll just go ahead and output a line of debug text. Again, doing the simplest possible thing here. <coughs> uh, I wanna, well, you know what? And I can even grab the code here. This is the code that actually is exactly what we want, right? Um, so all I'm gonna do is when you mouse in that rectangle, I'm just gonna go ahead and say, okay, uh, if the mouse is in the rectangle, go ahead and output a debug line of text uh, that happens to be all of the information that we used to print out for one of these guys, like cycle counts, uh, hit counts, that sort of thing, right? So how do I get that information out of this particular thing? Um, in this case, uh, when we do the region stuff, you know, I've got this, uh, these, these debug regions. I need some way of having the region correspond to something, uh, right? Because we're not storing that yet and I need a way of getting that out. Uh, so inside handmade platform.h, we've got sort of what is actually stored. Um, you know, right, we've got like the debug record, which has kind of the information about it. And then we've got the debug event, which says stuff like um, what, the, uh, what the clock was for the beginning and the end and that sort of thing. So I kind of need inside this region, I want to be able to act, you know, I want to be able to get at this uh, data. Uh, and, you know, I don't know that I want to necessarily point back to the event because the event, the collation kind of does uh, 
you know, I, I want the collation to probably take care of that. But the debug record for the file, the block name, the line number, that's probably more what I'd want, right? So I want this region uh, to probably have that in there. So I want to be able to say that there's a debug record off of the region so that I can grab it when we happen to mouse over it like so. Uh, and when I do that, <clears throat> uh, yeah, when I do that, uh, I can then use that record to get at least some of this information. I can get the block name, uh, I can get the line number there, uh, and then I can get sort of this, this other information. Uh, I might make this a little bit more extended. Uh, I might do something where we do like the block name, uh, and then, you know, maybe I think what might be more interesting than what we did before is at the very end, I'm thinking uh, I might do file and line. So it will do like the block name, uh, and then at the end, it would do, you know, the file name and the line number at the very end. So just be like where, you know, where this stuff is, right? Something like that. Uh, so yeah, so there's, there's that. We just say, okay, there's the block name. Um, and, uh, and then here comes the file name and line number. So there's the file name, there's the line number. Uh, and then inside here, we need to know some stuff. We want to know the cycle count. Uh, and the hit count is not relevant for this particular function. I guess, you know, these two things... Uh, are not particularly relevant uh, because we're talking about a specific slight, we're talking about a specific one of these. Uh, so for now, all I'm gonna say for that region is I'm just gonna say what the cycle count was. Uh, so I'd like the region uh, to have the cycle count in it. Uh, and that looks roughly right to me. Uh, so something like that, right? Um, for now. Okay, so if we do that, uh, then we can output it and that's all good. So now what we need to do is upgrade our uh, actual storage, our debug storage, to include that information, right? So it's gotta have a debug record in it. Uh, so here is the region. It's gotta know what the debug record is, and then it also has to know uh, what the clock count was, right? There is a cycle count in there. So that means that every time when we do a debug frame region, when we do add region, uh, we want to record that information, right? So I want to record the cycle count here, and I want to record uh, the debug record, you know? And it's pretty easy to do the cycle count, right? Because that's just the opening event clock. Um, we know, and we know the end clock, you know, we know, we know the range, it's just that. So it's pretty easy for us to determine what that, that is, right? There's not a lot of mystery there. Uh, so that's pretty simple. And then the debug record we already got, probably, I'm guessing, um, is, is probably already queried up here. Yeah, it's right there, it's called source. Um, so I'll just go ahead and, and drop that in as well. And so now we have all that information, right? Pretty straightforward, uh, debug overlay, debug overlay, debug overlay does not have its thing updated, game input, input like so. Uh, and uh, yeah, there we go. So I think that's roughly it. Let's fix that there. I think that's roughly it. So all we have to do now is kind of shore up uh, some of this code here. Uh, I don't remember if we ever did anything with rectangles. We did. Uh, so since we did stuff with rectangles, I'm just going to go ahead and leverage that that we already wrote. And I'm going to say that uh, we're going to make a rectangle two here. And I feel like push rect should really take rectangle twos optionally. And so that's, I think, would also be nice because it would fix some of this uh, absolute nonsense that was going on here uh, that I think even as I was typing it in, I said I was not super pleased with it. Uh, so let me take a look at what we have for Rectangle 2. Um, it looks like I can create one with the min and the max, and that's exactly what I want, right? Uh, so if I create a Rectangle here, rectangle 2 here with the min and the max, um, what I could do is say, all right, uh, I know the min... Uh, X min, the, the, you know, I know a bunch of this stuff, right? Here it is. I know the min and the max. Uh, the only thing I need to know now is what the X, what the min and max X are. Uh, and I, so, so that would just be this stuff here, uh, right? This is, uh, that's where the X starts. Uh, and then the X runs, uh, where is that width? It's lane width. In fact, you could really just think of it this way, right? Uh, so it's kind of like the, the lane index, it's, it's going from one to the next lane index as its, as its span, if you will, you know? 
so that's the rectangle. And that's all we really need there. What I would like to do again is just say, okay, I want to just be able to pass those around. I should, I feel like it's, it's uh, uh, well within reason to be able to pass those in. So if I had a rectangle two here, uh, where I've got, you know, um, this is the, uh, the region rect, something like that. Uh, I don't really like the way that's lining up. Let's do that, that's fine. Uh, so if I've got that, uh, then what I'd like to be able to do is pass that in here. So there's a region rect. Uh, and assuming that it's got a particular Z, you can see that it's Z is zero. Uh, so what I'd like to do is be able to just pass the, a 2D rectangle um, and a Z coordinate and have that expand out into uh, something that gets called, you know, passed to, to push rect. So it's basically just like does whatever fussy math it needs to, but it makes sure that that's the rectangle that actually gets pushed. So then what I can do is I can ask whether the mouse is in the rectangle. And I think we probably or again also actually implemented that. You can see it's we did right here, right? We have uh, is in rectangle. So we could do is in rectangle right here. There's the rectangle. And we could just say whatever the mouse P is, right? Whatever the point is that represents where that mouse is. And that's, again, really, really easy um, because we have that information. So the mouse P, if we want to get it, is just the input mouse X, input mouse Y. So we know where it is, uh, and I think that I implement one of those. Let's see if I did. Push rect. Uh, so I think that's really it for the most part. Um, that's like the entirety of the code. All we need is something that actually uh, handles that in the render group because I'm basically introducing a new way of pushing a rectangle uh, that's different from the way that it was pushing the rectangle before, right? Um, so if I go ahead and, and say like there's going to be a different inline for pushing a rectangle, it's going to be uh, a rectangle two, and here is the rectangle, and then there is uh, an R32 for the Z coordinate. Uh, then what I can do is say, all right, we can turn that into one of these for now. Uh, let the optimizer deal with it here, and if we ever find that it's a problem, we can write it uh, ourselves. But all we have to do is just do a get uh, center on the rectangle. I assume that's a call that we have. Let's find out if we ever wrote that, get center. Uh, there it is. So we can just get the center of that uh, and we can say that we want, uh, you know, uh, to make something with that center and the Z and the dimensions would just be, we actually also have that for get dim. Uh, so our rectangle, there we go, uh, is that and then we pass the color uh, straight through. And I think that's actually all we would need. Now let's test to see whether that works at all uh, in terms of drawing because I kind of just made that up. Uh, but it does look like uh, that part's working. So now all we have to do is get our mouse hover thing working. Uh, what we want to be able to do is mouse over these things and have them actually uh, show up. Now, as you can see, if I move the mouse around, we're not actually getting that. So we have to go ahead and uh, work on that code a little bit. There's one thing that I already know that we're going to have to do. That's why that wouldn't work. Um, but we probably have some other things to, to get that working as well. So what we want to do is, is now move into figuring out how to get the hover to work since now we've added the, the correct drawing there. We know that we're drawing that rectangle. Okay. Uh, so here's the problem, fundamentally, uh, that we are going to face. That is that the mouse, P, right, is not in the same space as our rendering space, right? Uh, because we don't, we didn't actually do any work to ensure that that was true. The mouse X mouse Y is just something that Windows is outputting in its coordinate space, and we uh, do not necessarily render in that space. So you can actually see uh, when we do our debug overlay, right? Um, when we actually do stuff here, that uh, uh, where is it? Debug reset. Uh, when we actually set up our debug rendering, you can actually see that we do an orthographic projection uh, and we use the width and the height. That creates a space where we, um, where we range from like negative, the, negative half the width to positive half the width, right? And negative half the height, uh, sorry, negative half the height to positive half the height. But that's not going to be uh, Windows' space at all. And so we have some decisions to make here, and I'm not really going to think too hard about this. I'm just gonna make it work here, and then later we can kind of decide whether we wanna push this down to the platform layer and make it be its responsibility 
to do this mapping. And in other words, the platform layer is handing us mass X and mass Y. Should the platform layer be responsible for putting it into a canonical or a thing like that? Uh, and the answer may be yes, right? But I'm gonna get it working here first and then we're gonna think about that and possibly push it down to the platform layer and say that Windows, uh, the platform layer will translate from Windows into our coordinate system. Uh, and there's some reasons we might wanna do that. Namely, if all of the platform layers are responsible for converting that uh, mouse coordinates, then we know that no matter what random mouse coordinate scheme they use, uh, it'll always be able to be written in the platform layer, something that will convert them into the ones we want, right? So what we need to do here is we need to say, all right, the mouse X ranges from zero to the width in Windows, I believe that's typically the way it goes. And we want to do, you know, we want to essentially subtract half the width from that, right? Uh, what we want to do is something more like this. We want to do 0.5 F times width, right? Uh, now we have to actually know what the width is, uh, which at the moment we don't actually have a way of, of telling that, I don't believe. You can see that it comes in here. Uh, so what we want to do is start storing that. And I think this also is a good point to time to get rid of these global variables as well. So I think we're going to do that immediately after we get hover working. Because again, I said when I first put them here, I was like, we want to go ahead and move these out. Now would be a good time to do that, right? So uh, I want to do something like this temporarily, but then we're going to change that. Uh, okay. Uh, so, you know, global width equals width, global height equals height. Uh, so that's what we're actually getting past. And what we want to do is say, well, there's this, there's some center, right? Uh, and I want to offset things uh, in terms of that center. So we'll do that. Uh, and then we'll do the same thing for the height. Uh, but the mouse, remember in Windows, it probably, I believe mouse coordinates are reported, right? From the top down we are bottom up. Uh, so really, this is going to go the other way. It's going to start at half the height and go down as the mouse increases. So it's gonna look a little bit more like that, right? So that's roughly what we're looking at. This is not correct yet. Uh, just to be clear, there's problems with this still, uh, but that's getting a little bit more towards uh, what we wanna do. Uh, so let's, uh, let's double check. Uh, and so I'll, I'm also, I'll show you uh, kind of a little bit of a, um, of a trick we can do here to, to make this a little bit easier. Uh, but let's see where we're at there uh, with that. Uh, yeah, so you can kind of see uh, that now we actually do have hover working. Don't ask me why that is down there. I do not know where that, why that is where it is. Uh, but now we can hover over any of these guys, right? And we can see the actual uh, information. I just, I do not understand why. Oh, I no, I do. You know what? I do understand why. Uh, where's that at, why? Yeah, it's because it prints it on the next one. That's why. Uh, so I'm going to skip that for a minute. Uh, I'm going to take that at Y there and say that this is going to be a global height. Uh, yeah, something like... I'm going to start this at the bottom of the screen and then I'm going to add, uh, well, no, that is the chart, man. So I'm just, I'm just going to do that. Oh, well, or I'm not. Chart min y is supposed to be negative over there we go, plus. 10, remember start from the bottom. I always think top down, even though I try pretty hard to not, uh, not do that. Uh, okay, so there we go. Yeah, uh, so there's reasons why we're, we're gonna have to fix a little bit of that, but it's fine. So now we can actually hover. So we're, you know, again, we've got sort of the, the basic thing going. We can hover over something and figure out who it is, right? Uh, and it's what we, it, these are what we expect to see, or at least it's what I expected to see, right? Uh, we can kind of see what's going on in each of these. Uh, and you can see that gigantic bar for debug collation, again, really pretty expensive, something that we're going to have to uh, certainly get down. Uh, but now we can kind of go, go ahead through here and figure out what these are. And so that's good. Uh, we've got some more work that we'd like to do to make that uh, work out okay, but, but off we go. So uh, like I said, though, we're not quite out of the woods yet. Uh, and the reason that I say that is because we have some things that are a little bit wonky, I think, in terms of the way this is working. Uh, so let me just see, I'm gonna also, uh, well, I guess I can't 
expand it past what the actual width is. So maybe that's not such a big deal. Uh, but anyway, you get the basic idea, right? Uh, so that's all good. Now, I do not know why our last frame time is 0, 0.00 milliseconds. That seems like a pretty odd uh, thing to have happen. So I'm, if, you'll, if you'll excuse me for one second, I would like to figure out why that actually is happening. Debug state frames, debug state frame count minus one. That's because that's the last frame that's open. I suppose that frame is not actually finished yet. Uh, so that makes sense. That does make some sense. I feel like we probably shouldn't put that frame into the rotation if it hasn't actually been closed yet. Um, if that makes sense. Uh, so I feel like it should be more like, you know, when we do the frame count. I don't know if you noticed that, but like when we do the frames, the last frame that we create is never actually, it doesn't actually get um, closed because the frame marker hasn't occurred for it yet since the debug co collation runs before the frame marker finishes. Uh, so I feel like that one should not really be n in there, if that makes sense. So I feel like that in terms of, of how that works, uh, I feel like the frame count uh, stuff should actually be be a little more conservative. So in here, uh, when we get to this, I feel like we should take back one frame, uh, assuming it never gets actually cleared. So, you know, at the end of all this, after we do, uh, after we do that stuff, we would do something like taking away one frame. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the best way to do that is. It might be something like this, uh, where we only increment that frame count when we actually have a positive frame. So we're like, okay, we had a frame, it completed, now we increment the frame count. That might be reasonable. Let's find out. So there's, that's a little bit better. Uh, so, all right, so now we're hovering over this stuff and that's good, right? Everyone likes a little bit of a hover now and again. Uh, but like I said, I don't love that. And the reason is because, you know, cross platform wise, we don't know what those mass coordinates are going to be doing. And basically what we'd have to do is all the platform layers would then have to emulate the way Windows does their mouse, uh, which doesn't necessarily make much sense considering the fact that the very first thing we're doing with that data is swapping it over into our coordinate system. It seems like it would make more sense for the platform layer to translate the mouse into our coordinate system instead. You know what I mean? Which is a center, you know, Y is up centered coordinate system. Uh, so that seems like a little more logical to me. So I think that's where I'd like to push that. I think I'd like to push it down to that. Uh, and then we can move on from there. All right. Uh, so if we go ahead and move down from there, here we are uh, in uh, Win32 Handmade. There's the mouse X, uh, mouse Y stuff. And so what I want to do here is I want to perform this transform at a different time, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, instead of doing it here, what I want to do is I want to make it so I can just do uh, mouse X, mouse Y, like so. And that's, you know, all I would then have to worry about. Uh, and so if I look at mouse X, mouse Y uh, in the platform layer, oops, if I actually spell it right. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change those to R32 so that they can be floats across the boundary. Uh, which is what I would think I would prefer. Um, and I'm just going to assume that when we actually create this, this piece of information, um, I'm going to take, uh, again, and pre-do that sort of transform that I was doing before. Uh, so basically, the mouse P, um, X and Y, are going to have uh, themselves sort of flipped around. So how would I do that? Uh, in here, I've got my game display somewhere. See, display game. It's like buffer or something, right? It's been a long time since we worked with this code. Off screen buffer. Win32 off screen. Oops. Buffer. Win32 off screen buffer, star buffer. Uh, where is that in our main loop? It should be somewhere, should it not? It is global back buffer. That is what it is. Uh, all right, so if we've got a global back buffer, uh, what I want to do here is say that the global back buffer is width, right? And the global back buffer is height. Uh, I'm going to take those guys and I'm going to do exactly what I did with them before. Uh, so we're going to take 
uh, negative half the width, which is starting at the left side of the screen in our coordinate system, and then I'm going to add uh, the mouse P to that, which should move it across, right? Uh, and I'm going to do the same thing with the height here, right? So I'm going to take uh, start negative half, and then the mouse, since the mouse actually goes up, right, I'm going to subtract it uh, because as the mouse gets bigger, uh, it should go, oh, um, sorry, that's not quite right. What I meant to say is start at the top of the screen, um, and then as the mouse goes down, I'm going to subtract from it, right? Uh, now, I think, if I'm not very much in error, which of course I may be, uh, I think that's not quite correct. Uh, I think that's off by one pixel. And the reason that I say that, right, um, if we take a look here at the blackboard. Uh, so here is day 188. Uh, if you take a look at what's happening here, uh, if, the, if the mouse x is actually equal to zero, right? Uh, then what we want to do is we want to be on that first pixel, right? Uh, which is negative 0.5 uh, times the width over, potentially. Uh, but when we get over to this pixel, right? I, and again, this, this kind of lar is largely about our pixel centers, which we haven't really formally defined, which is probably a bad idea. Um, it's something maybe we should address sooner rather than later. Um, but anyway, uh, what we don't know, what, what's unclear, is what we want the convention to be for where these pixels lie. So is negative 0.5 times the width, is that lying on this pixel or at the edge of this pixel? And similarly, is plus 0.5 lying on a pixel or on the edge of the pixel? And the reason that this actually is important uh, is because if you think about what happens if you center your coordinate system, then 0, 0 is actually in a middle row, right? It's a, it's a middle column, if you will, and a middle row. Where does that actually lie, right? Is it off by half a pixel or is it actually on a pixel? If it's on a pixel, remember, we have 1920 uh, on our, in a 1080p resolution. That's how many pixels there are, right? So 1920 divided by 2, yeah, uh, is going to be equal to, right, uh, sorry, it's 10 for this, uh, and then that's going to be 9. Uh, so it's actually going to have to, to carry itself out. So it's going to be what, like 960, right? Got to actually do long division. You don't do this much anymore. At least I don't. Uh, so yeah, 2, right, times 9 is 18. Uh, grab the 120. That's going to be 6. Yeah, I was right. Uh, so it's going to be 960 pixels, two sets of 960 pixels, which means that the midline is not on a pixel. It's on the boundary between two pixels. It is in between pixel 959 and pixel 960. So the middle of the screen is actually pixel 959.5, right? So you see the dilemma, right? You see what I'm, what I'm saying here. Um, at least hopefully you see what I'm saying here. I don't know. It's one of those things that only graphics programmers get persnickety about. I'm not really that much of a graphics programmer, but you know, you can understand, you can understand the reason if you want to get every last little thing right, you can understand why there's a bit of a, a problem there uh, in terms of how this stuff actually works out uh, because you know, you have to think about kind of what lines up where and why these things do what they actually do, right? Uh, and so if this right here, um, if, if this is negative 960 and this is positive 960, right? Um, then yeah, if those, if those are meant to actually be specific pixels, it means that the midline, uh, the zero is, has to be in between two. There's no other way to interpret that coordinate system and still have uh, the right number of pixels. You can't insert a phantom row, a, a column of pixels and have it actually be there. Yeah. So that's how that works. Um, don't know what else to say other than that. That's just how that works. Uh, so I assume uh, that if we were to do that, uh, if we were to take negative 960 and we put it there, uh, again, 
I think what's actually um, what's actually going to be true uh, of this coordinate system, right, is that if the mouse x is set to zero, then we will get uh, we would get the negative 960, right? Uh, if it was set uh, to 1919, which is the furthest pixel over it can be, it would be at plus 959, right? So it actually wouldn't be able to get uh, to that one extra pixel. And so that's kind of also, that's kind of, again, the dilemma that I initially started with. It's sort of like saying, well, okay, do we actually want this one to line up at negative 959.5, right? So that we actually do have a full span so that this one goes so that the plus and the minus are equivalent because that way if we take right if you're if you're like how many pixels are there actually in between these two right how many are there if i take uh 959.5 uh, and sub subtract negative 950 959.5 uh, right that actually gives me uh, the 1920 that i needed right so yeah right I, like I said, I don't really know. I don't really know how we want to uh, to think about that. I don't really know what the best way is to do that. I'm not sure. This is one of those things where I feel like uh, being a more persnickety graphics programmer would be helpful because I'd have uh, a stronger opinion about pixel centers, which is what this kind of thing, uh, which is the domain in which this sort of thing falls, if you will. Uh, and you know, in my, in my gut, I feel like I don't like the idea of having different bounds to the left and to the right. But at the same time, I also don't know if I love the idea of the mouse always being on half coordinates, right? Um, so I don't know. I really don't know. Since it's only for debug, maybe it doesn't matter that much. Uh, but point being, if we actually want to do it, right, if we actually want to do it that way, what it would be is it would be this, right? It would be negative width plus half a pixel, then plus the X, that would actually give you uh, the entire span. Hopefully that makes some sense. Like I said, it's very persnickety, um, but right, this would be the other way. Uh, again, starting at 0.5, starting at that half pixel and going uh, through it. Uh, and that would mean, like I said, now the center, the very center, um, is is actually going to be on an actual pixel boundary so you know go go figure so i don't know uh i don't know i'm gonna leave it that way for now but but you know if, if people if there's a if there's people who are more persnickety about pixel centers i would very much be interested to hear your opinions on it um it's the kind of thing that i think through sometimes when i'm doing rendering but i don't uh, have as strong of opinions on it as I possibly should have, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, let's see how we're doing here. Uh, looks like we're fine. Yeah. So that's all good. Okay, so now we've got about 20 minutes left. <clears throat> mm. Gotta stretch a little bit. Gotta stretch it out. Uh, so now what we want to do is, is uh, let's let's try and have some way uh, that we can we can interact with this a little bit more. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have a way of saying stop the collation where we're at, freeze it essentially, uh, so that, that we're not going to uh, record any more any more information. Right? We're just going to stop. Uh, and in order to do that. Um, I guess what I would want to do is say, okay, uh, let's see here. I think in order to do that, maybe the best way to go would be to just say this stuff here, uh, where we kind of do our, our allocation and our end temporary sort of stuff. I think I could just make that predicated, right? Uh, so I could just say, you know what? Can we just do something like this, where we do if debug state, um, uh, frozen or paused, something like that. Uh, and so then in the debug state, I could just have something that's like B32 paused. Uh, and then, you know, whenever we do this, we could do something like um, at the end, 
uh, of, of our overlay here uh, when we're doing our, um, our debug overlay. I could just do something where we say, oh yeah, you know, if the mouse buttons, and I don't really remember much about how our mouse buttons worked, to be completely honest with you. Uh, so if our mouse buttons, are these enumerated in any particular way? Doesn't look like it. At least it doesn't look like it to me. Yeah. So I would say that if the mouse buttons, um, I'm going to go ahead and add an enumerant there, Win32 handmade. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and add one there. I'm going to do something like, uh, you know, enum game input mouse button. I'm going to do, uh, let's see, platform. Is it platform? Should I call it platform? Do we have any enumerants here at all? Oh, we have like no enumerants in our platform layer. Yeah. All right. Well, let's see here. I'm going to call it uh, platform mouse button left, middle, right, extended zero, extended one. And I'm going to use these in the platform layer now. So we'll just say, yep. And there we have it. So that's all good. And now I can actually go in here and, and say by name the one that I want. Uh, so I'm going to say whenever we hit maybe the right button, uh, we'll go ahead and toggle that. Uh, and I'm also going to do, I don't know if we have a went down macro, right? Uh, let's see, form. we don't, uh, at least we don't seem to, I don't see one. Uh, so I'm assuming that we do half transition count. Do we not check buttons anywhere? Half, half transition count. Well, we really just don't ever use this, do we? Huh. That's a bit odd, wouldn't you say? I thought we used this for something. So we just use whether it ended down or not. That's all we do. If it ended down, we, we set one of those and off we go. So we never use the half transition count, which is odd. All right, well, I'm going to introduce a new thing then, because I don't really like that idea. Uh, I would like there to be, right, for this platform thing, uh, I would like there to be a way that we can trivially tell whether something was, uh, went down or not. We have a half transition count, so we know when it went down, when it went up, whatever, right? Uh, so really what we want to know is something like uh, was pressed, you know? Uh, so if we have a game button state, right, and then we want to know if it was pressed, oops, uh, it's pretty easy to figure out if a button was pressed, right? All we have to do is say, <clears throat> so if the state, if the half transition count is greater than zero, uh, meaning there was at least one transition from up to down or down to up, uh, and it ended down, right? Uh, then we know that it was a kind of pressed. I, what I'd like, to, I'd like to do, I'd actually like to count it. So if the half transition count um, is actually, you can come to think of it, if it's greater than one, then it definitely had to go down, right, at some point. Because it went from down to up or up to down twice. If it's greater than one. So if it's greater than one, obviously it was pressed. Or if the, if the transition count equals one, and it ended down, right? That means that it was pressed during 
you know, this particular time, time slice. I think that's what I, I think that's roughly what I would like, uh, if I'm understanding that correctly. So what I'm going to do here is say, if it was, if we pressed that button, uh, then I would like uh, to pause the debugging. Uh, so, you know, for sort of chugging along here and I hit the right mouse button, I want that to stop. Of course, that doesn't work at all, which is not good, which is bad, which is just, just, I just don't understand why the code doesn't work sometimes. Why does it have to be so mean? Um, so yeah, uh, so let me just double check. I probably just did something stupid there. So if the half transition count is greater than one, then we know that it was pressed. If the half transition count uh, equals one and it ended down, then we know that it was pressed as well. That seems right. Uh, oh. Uh, How did that get returned true? I obviously just typed something really stupid there. Hold, please. The result is that whatever the state is, it has a half transition count of greater than one, which in this case we know it didn't, because I, at least I don't think it did, uh, or, it had a hash transition count that was one and it ended down. That looks right to me. Is our, are our mouse button states busted? Kind of interested to see. No. Got a result of zero. Okay. So that's working now. So we must not clear them or something, right? Yeah, like we don't clear, we just got a, we've got a platform bug there. We got, we got a, we got a platform bug is what we got. All right, where is that bug? That bug, that bug is, is in there somewhere. Win32 process keyboard message. Hmm, let's go see where that's at. What's it doing? Uh, oh, so, do we probably just never cleared these guys? Did we? In fact, what's actually what actually clears these buttons? Am I am I just am I Yeah. I'm I'm a little bit I'm a little bit nervous about that code. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not thinking that maybe that was um, maybe that was so good. Here's the mouse buttons. That's the only place uh, that it ever gets referenced. That's not good, right? Because it's never going to get cleared. Ever 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 again. Um, that's that's a problem. That is a problem. Uh, and since we're doing it this way, hmm, we have to fix this. This is bad, people. This is this was this was just a bad. This is this was BS. This was bad science, right here. Uh, so uh, bad software. Uh, so yeah, what we want to do here is say, okay, we, we get this half transition count and that's fine, but okay, so at the start of the frame, we just need to clear the half transition count, right? Um, I think that's probably all we need to do. So when we process the keyboard message, this will do it. Uh, so yeah, so I think what we want to do here is say, set this thing uh, half transition count we want these all to be zero, right? So we want to do like left, middle, right, extended zero, extended one. Let's see if that does any better. Okay.
Much better. It looks like it's tr double triggering though. So that's still not quite right. That's still not quite right. We set the house transition count to zero. And that seems reasonable. And then this stuff should be, oh, and also these, yeah, it needs to copy this, it needs to copy this stuff. So this, this code is just all garbage, really. Uh, because we need to copy our old state from the new one to the old one, right? And we weren't doing that either. So it's just, this is just, this is just totally nonsense. This is like the most nonsensy of nonsense things. Let's, let's see if we can write something that's not total garbage. I mean, it's still kind of garbage, but let's just see if we can write something better. So here's the mouse button index. We have seven minutes left on the clock, yes? So I think we started about 10 minutes late. Platform mouse button count, mouse button index. So what we want to do is say the mouse button new, let's see, buttons. Uh, you know, I could just shorten that to button index. So we could just say that the button index, copy the old one, like so. Uh, and then we can just say that uh, the half transition count equals zero. Uh, and then we might as well go ahead and that on in there, right? Uh, and we can just have that be D word uh, win button ID and can't do that. Uh, yeah, and then we can just put these in here. VKM button, oops, L and R X. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When button ID, button index, and button index now is all set. Uh, so that looks a little better. A little better. Not the world's best or anything, uh, but that looks a little better. And as a bonus, it also actually works, which is nice. Uh, so now we can come in here and actually, you know, sort of look at these guys a little more carefully. Um, we could also make them a little larger if we wanted to, so they weren't so hard to, to pinpoint. That would be nice as well. Uh, but we're getting there, right? We're getting there. So now we have the way to pause our debug input and to hover over our debug input as well. Uh, and then pretty much the next thing that we should do tomorrow, I'll probably wrap it up now, I just don't want to start a new thing quite yet, uh, is we should have some way uh, of starting to click and inspect these guys, which should be pretty easy. And also we can clean up this output stuff as well. Uh, all right, so we're getting there. We're in good shape. We're in pretty good shape. It's true. It is true. All right, folks. Let's do some Q&A here. If you have questions about what just happened before your eyes, uh, it's what's coming at you what just came at you, uh, please feel free to ask it now, put a Q colon in, and I will answer the question. Put the pig hat on the owl. No, the, hat, the owl of shame is not piggy at the moment. I will not do that. I had owl of shame, what was my owl of shame moment? What was the, where was the owl of shame moment? Oh, you think that the, the mouse code being buggy for 150 days brings on the owl? I, that's not an owl of shame. We never used the mouse code. We just put it in there. I mean, we've never actually gone and tried to use it. I, I know that's not an owl of shame. An owl of shame is when you do something like really stupid, where it's just like, oh, you know, how did you, how were you so dumb? It's like, that was just like, all right, we threw some mouse code in there. It wasn't good. That's fine. I'm that, I don't consider that an owl of shame. That's, that's just programming. That happens every day. <laughs> Will almond milk make you smarter? I do not know. Shark93, on behalf of all the people here, we love you and you're awesome. I love you guys too. You are also awesome. 
it is pretty darn nice that people show up every day uh, to watch this stream because I'll be honest with you, it would be pretty lonely programming here by myself. That would not be a fun way to spend an hour and a half. So I thank everyone for showing up. It's been pretty awesome that there's so many people and, and seeing the same faces come back multiple times and get to, getting to know people is pretty, pretty darn cool too. So, so thank you guys for being awesome. Uh, Epigoon00, I'm new here. Why constrain yourself to one hour segments? Isn't ramp up time every day hard? Uh, you know, I think, I think uh, the reason for the one hour segments is really because um, <clears throat> programming is easy to do for long periods of time. You know, I can program for eight hours and that's not a big deal. But explaining programming for eight hours, I would be really dead by the time I did that after, you know, a couple days of that, right? So keeping it to one hour is one way of just making sure that even on bad days, I still have a little bit of explanatory ability. Um, because it is really hard to program and explain at the same time. It's a lot harder than just programming and uh, it, it takes, it's, it's tough to do. Uh, so, so I feel like keeping it constrained is a, it makes it into little like segments is a good way to make sure that I don't just totally fail to explain what I'm doing. How would you go about optimizing the debug rendering? Uh, well, first of all, we could optimize a lot of the rectangle stuff and all that. Yeah, and, and you're right. Entity basis calculations could be gotten rid of because we're going straight through on these guys. They're not, they don't need any 3D transforms or anything. So, but I don't think that's most of it. Draw a rectangle probably, optimizing that would be the way to go. Unfortunately, right now, well, not unfortunately, perhaps you could say fortunately, the time is not spent there, right? So take a look, that stuff right there that's the debug render time, those, those, those guys right there. This is the debug collation time. So it's really the collation time that's expensive, not the rendering time. And fortunately for us, the collation time is easy to improve. All we have to do right off the bat to make it eight times faster than it is right now is to just store collated frames and only collate new frames as they come as necessary, basically. So, so we, we have a lot of options for making that faster. But as, even as it is, if we just left it the way it is now, we could leave it the way it is now and it wouldn't be the end of the world. So that's fine, because remember it's debug code. This is a totally fine speed to play the game at in testing. Um, so, you know, I'd be okay with that too. And this isn't even an optimized build, right? You know, like if you wanted to, you could go in here and, and O2 that, you could O2 some of that up, get a little O2 going on, you know what I'm saying? A little oxygen, a little O2. Oops. Of course, you should probably wait till the build actually finished, finishes. It's true. Uh, so if we O2'd it, uh, then it's even smoother, right? Yeah. Wow, so our frame wait, our frame wait time is, kind of looks just busted. Like I've said, but I've said many, many times so far, I think this is gonna tell us a lot of stuff that we don't know about our code. And I'm really excited about that. Like, look at that frame wait time. Like what's going on there? That is just not right. Um, so yeah, we're gonna learn, we're gonna learn good stuff from this. I promise you that. James Woodman, you've trained everyone to listen for whether you pronounce the letter T or it's allophone, the glottal stop, when you say the word button. It's true. I, I like saying button uh, just fine in normal speech, but sometimes, uh, especially on the stream, I like saying button. I like, I like over-pronouncing button. I don't know why. Uh, Chrono Dragon, shoot, I wasn't paying attention. I used the mouse code in another program. What was broken about it? Uh, I just didn't clear itself from the new old input thing. The mouse, the actual way to read the mouse in Windows was totally fine. It was just how we were updating our mouse info. James Whitman, at some point, would it make sense to pause and redisplay the frame that is currently moused over? Uh...
you know, if we were going to sell this engine or something, yes. Because we can, we have the ability to do that. Does it make sense to implement that on the, on the stream? I don't know that it would actually pay off uh, to do. So, so I don't know if there's really any reason to spend the stream time to make that happen. Uh, but if you were just going for the gusto, yeah, you, you could do that. Shark93, by the way, I'm from Iraq and it's 4 a.m. right now. Can you sometime do an earlier stream? I don't mind not sleeping until 4 a.m., but in two or three week university start, and it would be awesome if you bring back early hours. Uh, this is the only time it really fits in my schedule most of the time. Uh, at the moment, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so that's why it is the time that it is. Uh, it's not because I don't because uh, I don't want it to be more accessible. I, you know, I just I just can't. I'm sorry. Quartertron, I think you only render top level de debug time functions. Are you planning on drilling down? Yes, uh, that is like like I said. The next thing we're doing is just uh, when we get left click, we'll, we'll implement a left click where you can drill down. Uh, that's what we'll be doing next. Fire Drake, what is the other long bar? Some kind of frame weight? Should it be that long? Uh, oh, sorry, you probably asked that before I myself asked that and complained about it. Uh, Disruptor, are you an indie developer and or is this your professional job? If not, what is your day job? Uh, yes, I am. Well, I, I most of the time I wasn't an indie developer. I was just a regular developer. Um, I did game technology at Rad Game Tools. Uh, that's That was what most of my professional career was. Uh, at the moment, I am doing an indie game. Uh, but that's a that's a new thing for me. Tom's Tom Sar, I forget if the white line is 33 milliseconds or 60 milliseconds. Could you add a green line for 60 hertz, orange for 30, red for 10, or something? Uh, yeah, we'll we'll we're gonna make that graph a lot nicer uh, in in over the next few days. Now that we've done like the the underlying work, so we should we should get that out. Uh, eggs of eggs o dragon i noticed in task manager that all of my steam games are 32 processes is there a really good reason to compile games to 30 bits rather than 64 uh it's just compatibility uh microsoft because they they uh like extracting money out of people uh tries to make 64-bit windows an upsell so 32-bit windows is a cheaper skew than 64-bit windows um it's so like i've said before microsoft just you know they don't care about developers they don't care about the fact uh, that it makes developers' life hard to keep having to support 32-bit for no reason at all. They're just like, don't worry about it. Um, we're just here for the money, and uh, you guys can can go have another compatibility nightmare courtesy of Microsoft. So that's the world we live in, unfortunately, and until they stop doing that, shipping 32-bit executables is the best way to ensure maximum compatibility. If you don't care, uh, you certainly could get away with shipping a 64-bit only executable because it's true that it's only like 10% of the market or something. Uh, but again, you know, that's just just a game you got to play, unfortunately. Uh, so I says, okay, the debug displays for processing time. Are we going to do any visuals for memory usage? Yeah, I would like to, after we finish with this, add um, uh, the same kind of markup for the memory. Uh, so so that that is something that I would like to do, yes. All right, looks like that's the end of the questions. Would you be willing to do a one to two hour pre-stream? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I mean, maybe once in a while, but but not every day, no. Uh, all right, I'm going to wind it down since it looks like we're done with the uh, the cues. The que oh, dear. Right, don't touch the Wacom tablet. Oh, my God. What happened? I don't know what just happened. My, my, my blackboard, like, went nuts. Help. What? What happened? Oh, there's all the there it all is. 
Ah. Mischief. Not a scalable program, apparently. We have, like, come to the point where it's unable to, like, keep up with us. Look at all that. Oh, my lord. Oh, my, my goodness. Look. Oh, weird. There's, like, a parallel... It's like another trail of stuff over there. I'm gonna go right in the middle here. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna leave us right here. That's what I'm gonna do. All right, file, save, minimize. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone, for joining me for an ep another episode of Handmade Hero. It has been a pleasure coding with you, as always, and I'm glad that we are now having a, a nicer debug uh, view. I'm, I'm looking forward to the next few days of just, like, implementing some UI stuff. I think it's going to be kind of cool uh, so that we can kind of look at all that information that we're capturing. I am into that. And I think it's going to be pretty nifty. Uh, so uh, hopefully you will continue to join me. Uh, I'll be back here tomorrow, 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And at that time, I would love to see you here again for some more good UI upgrades to our debug system. So that's going to be pretty fun. Hope to see you here for that. In the meantime, if you want to follow along at home with the source code, it comes with the pre-order of the game. So if you pre-order Handmade Hero on HandmadeHero.org, uh, you can download it every night right after I'm done with it. I upload it. Uh, so check that out if you're interested in playing around and learning from the, uh, the source code. We also have a forum site you can go to ask questions uh, and if you want to, uh, to look at annotated episode guide by some of the people who are on the chat, actually. Uh, community members do an annotated episode guide up there. It's pretty cool. We have a Patreon page you can support the video series on. Uh, we have a tweet bot that tweets schedule you if you're trying to catch it live. Uh, and so please check out those links uh, for more information. Until then, or I should say until tomorrow, uh, when, we, when we come back for a little more debug UI fun, uh, Please have fun coding, and I'll see you guys on the internet. Take it easy, everyone.